And won't I be accomplishing what yesterday's attempt sought to do but could not? A baby is born and all the other branches fall off the tree. Assassination by procreation. <laughs> Is it just me or does the second episode of Foundation's second season feel like it's reached a balance between the different storylines that was lacking in the first season? This episode has a ton going on in multiple locations that aren't immediately connected to each other, but the shape of the series and the way things will all connect is starting to come together. The premiere set up the idea that the Empire is in decline and that the Cleons are dealing with this by projecting strength. This week we learn that the way that the Foundation presents itself isn't a fair representation of how things are really developing there either. This even extends to the characters. Queen Sarath is having fun poking holes in the Empire's cover story, and I think we're all enjoying that. But we also learn that part of the reason that she's doing that might be to cover up the fact that she's not prepared to rule. It all makes for some fun that wasn't necessarily a big part of the first season's appeal. This episode also delivers a lot of direct references to Asimov's books, which you won't hear me complaining about, while continuing to carve out its own unique take on the big ideas they introduce to readers. The new Foundation characters give us an interesting meditation on personal faith and how power structures can exploit that. Empire is giving us a look at what happens when those structures start to break down. And if Harry, Gale, and Salvor can figure out a way to work together, it seems like their complementary skill sets might be sufficient to figure out how to get things back on track. Since it's titled A Glimpse of Darkness, let's start there. Episode 1 ended with Harry telling Gale it was time they had a reckoning. And that's where their story picks up in Episode 2. He confirms that he was conscious for the entire 138 years he was trapped in the storage device in Rach's knife, which from what we saw of that, it didn't look fun. There's not much Gail can say to defend her decision when she's pressed by Harry and later Salvor. She was essentially just processing that Rach was dead, and Harry's withholding of so much information was troubling in light of that. The problem is that the whole plan was predicated on the creation of a second foundation. And Gail wrecked that part of things when she left the Raven behind. Salvor, who doesn't have much insight into the whys and hows of the plan, focuses on the present and the coming conflict between the Foundation and Empire. This opens the door for Harry to reinforce that fundamental truth about psychohistory. That they can't introduce too much information about what it predicts because that could change the way the masses act. And this leads to Gale figuring out why the second foundation is so important. Harry's plan calls for a group of psychohistorians who understand the math and have access to the plan to apply their knowledge judiciously and with intent to quietly alter the Empire's course. But they're also supposed to do that for the first foundation as well if necessary. So I guess, way to go Gale, you really kind of screwed things up there. Again, Salvor's there to ask all the important questions for the normies, and points out that this all sounds like they're talking about Terminus as the enemy. The same Terminus that Harry planned and set up where Gale was supposed to be there and play a key role in developing the Foundation that would then usher in a new and improved Empire, while drastically shortening the chaos that's going to follow the fall of the current one. It's a fair question, but Harry has an answer that makes sense. They're not the enemy now, but power corrupts. Which means a foundation left unchecked will eventually become Empire all over again. As they're talking, Gale comes clean about the dream she had on Synax. They put it together that it's about 150 years in the future, and Harry encourages her to project her consciousness there. This isn't something she's done on demand before, so there's some trial and error. After a failed attempt, she realizes that she's always been asleep or under stress when she's had one of these prophetic dreams, and is reminded of how the Synaxian seers would deprive themselves of oxygen to open their inner eye. She vents the air in the room to simulate drowning, and she's able to access the same scene she saw in the dream. It looks like there's a war going on, and she's attacked by a new character who is happy to find her without her warriors. He asks about the second foundation, and says he can look into her mind. When he does that, he realizes what she's doing, that she's projecting herself, and questions whether she's from the Age of Empire before Hober Mallow poked its eye. 
When they wake her up, she says he calls himself the Mule, and that he's conquered most of the galaxy but isn't satisfied. He's after the second foundation because he's afraid that they're the only ones that can stop him. She also says he's a telepath like them, only stronger. And this is all big news and we're going to have to wait a while to figure out what's happening because they don't really say too much more about it. His mention of mentalic seems important and when she looked in his mind she saw a origin or a planet where they come from called Ignis and that gives them a new place to go after they leave Synax. When they look Ignis up in the system, Salvor says she can almost hear it, like the planet itself is calling out, and eventually Gale can get a sense of that too. Later she reveals to Salvor that there was one thing that she left out. Gale saw Salvor's dead body in her vision, which seems to give her an expiration date. The name Hober Mallow comes up again in the Terminus storyline, which starts on a different planet in the Outer Reach named Savena. We meet a new character there, a novice cleric that goes by the name of Brother Constant. She was sent by the Foundation as a representative of the Church of the Galactic Spirit. We see that the locals aren't very welcoming through her discovery of another cleric's dead body that was strapped to a tree where it was struck by lightning. There's a lot going on here, including the return of the Season 1 character, Polly Beresoff, who is now an important cleric with some substance abuse issues. But I think it makes sense to focus more on the big picture rather than the details, because who even knows if we'll return to this planet? One thing that did stand out beyond how fun and absolutely as mobian the magic show was is that there was a man mixed in with the mob that appeared to be spying or something along those lines. The camera lingers on him a couple different times and at one point you see him put his hand up to his head and there's a light in his eye that indicates that he's recording what they're saying or something like that. Since this mob seems to be their opposition on the planet and the Empire has left, I'm not really sure what the implications of his presence are. What we see on Savena and what will later be confirmed on Terminus is that the church's missionary work is just for recruitment. Brother Constant does seem to be a true believer in Harry's message, as is Polly Beresoff, who was there the first time he came out of the vault. But the recruitment strategy involves using their advanced tech to give the rubes a magic show and wow them with the galactic spirit. They are offering to improve their conditions because they have been abandoned by Empire, but while the clerics are the public face winning them over, things are much different behind the scenes on Terminus. We see that firsthand when they return. And before we get into that, I brought up this advanced tech, which we see that they have personal auras like the Cleons and things like that, but their ship also jumps straight back to Terminus. What's interesting about that was that in the last episode, Brother Don mentioned the idea of needing spacers to jump, which you don't see on this ship, and that shows that the Foundation has surpassed the Empire in their ship technology. When they return, we get several hints that tie back to what Harry was telling Salvor on the beggar. 138 years on, and to be fair, guided by what Harry said the last time he popped out of the vault, the Foundation has evolved into something much different than what she remembers. Polly as a character is a great way to bridge the gap between them. He is a true believer, but the long wait has led him to question his faith. And none of the current leaders there take him seriously beyond his ability to use his magic to recruit more worlds to their cause. He points out the Foundation is supposed to offer people a rational blueprint for a new society, and what they're actually doing is going out there and pushing the idea of salvation to further the advancement of their tech and a buildup of their military might. There's an interesting moment when the director asks him if he's been to the church to see their new technologies that highlights how things can get off course. Polly asks first if they're deadly, and then follows up with, are they expensive? And does that mean that they'll tax their citizens more, and then will those that are in charge get a cut of that? His point is that Selden was a teacher and not a trader, and while that is true, the Foundation also needed to develop so that they would be able to defend themselves once the Empire found out that they were still there and they were gaining strength and support. So like most things, it's a little more complicated than what either side is arguing here. 
And this is a big part of why the early stories and the source material were so interesting. So it is nice to see the show doing a pretty good job of incorporating those ideas here. The new warden explains that he'll be going alone to approach the vault and hopefully talk to Harry Seldon. When he gets there, he delivers a fairly moving speech to the citizens before he decides to just enter the vault since Harry's not coming. And I think it's safe to say that this does not go as he planned because he's lifted up off the ground and then vaporized. He is killed while repeating the name Hober Mallow. He says to find Hober Mallow and we see the name appear on the vault and just in case you weren't sure if this is someone we've met or if this is a name you're supposed to know, it's only been mentioned once and that was in Gale's narration in the first episode of the series. So this isn't a character we've been introduced to yet. On Trantor, Demerzel goes to tell Brother Day that Dawn and Dusk's memory audits came back negative. They weren't behind his assassination attempt, or more precisely, they don't remember hiring someone to kill Day. She also mentions editing the memories of the staff so they'll have no recollection of seeing them so compromised. He was looking at the mural when she found him and brings up Empress Hanlow, who he says is one of the greats, and her daughter, a gangly child who would go on to become Empress Emenotech, arguably an even greater ruler. Their dynasty began 4,000 years ago and ended two millennia later, which is far longer than the current Cleonic Age, and covered four times the area and oversaw a blossoming of science and culture. This is Brother Day behind the scenes, with no one else around besides Demerzel. These are the things that he thinks about. He's lamenting a situation in the current declining state of the empire, which illustrates that the public bravado and shows of strength are all calculated ways to conceal the truth. All of this works to strengthen his resolve to move forward and to solidify his marriage with Queen Sarath. Demerza also tells him that she found someone to engage the foundation. When she starts to share the details, he realizes she's talking about the yet-to-be-introduced new character, Bell Rios, and that sends him into a tirade. This boils down to Rios not following a direct order that Empire gave, which seems to have been the right decision based on what Demerzel says, but still, he has to be the Emperor and he has to go through his spiel. After he does that, he collects himself and asks her how long she thought his rant would last which shows just how in sync these two characters are. And then he gives her permission to talk to Rio, saying, if he refuses, kill him. As he goes, Demerzel lingers to look at the mural and focuses specifically on Empress Hanlow, which is something that may be important down the road. After that, we see the three brothers practice eating with empty plates and glasses so that they can present as the same person when they host Sarath and join a rue later. Don questions her about Cloud Dominion, and things get noticeably flirty. He seems to like her, and she doesn't seem to mind if that's a little weird considering she's getting married to a different version of him. When Dusk makes a joke about having bad knees, she continues to take shots, asking why he would worry about that. Couldn't he just decant another one of himself and take his knees? After some back and forth and some unconvincing attempts to act like these are all just innocent questions because, after all, aren't they meant to be family? She brings up her own family's accident. They offer condolences and she explains how her older siblings were the ones who were raised to be rulers while she was raised as a dilettante. Now she finds herself as Dominion with no education on how to rule. Which is interesting because she seems very confident in the way that she presents herself. So there is a noticeable parallel between her and Day. She asks to see the clones, and it looks like Demerzel almost intervenes, but Day does agree to show her. In the Principium, they continue the game they're playing. She continues to say things that no one should say to the Emperor, and he pretends to find it charming. But the looks on his face often tell a different story. They talk about memories and how those are transferred, and what will happen to the clones after they create an heir. And then she tells him that she's heard rumors that the genetic material was corrupted a long time ago. Which of course is the truth, but no one's supposed to know about that. And while they go through a lot of different things that might turn out to be important here, the biggest thing that works about it is that it's a lot of fun to watch. And it's compelling because it isn't clear if she's just that clever or if someone might be feeding her information. 
You also can't tell if she's there because of this accident that killed her family, or that the accident happened so that she would be the one who's there. There's a great dynamic between these characters, and I can't wait to see where it goes next because the episode pretty much ends there. As I said at the beginning, this is one of the first episodes where I wasn't bothered jumping from place to place and felt an almost equal investment in everything that's happening. The Empire storyline still has a head start, but the other two are catching up. The much older version of Polly Barisoff is a great addition. The actor does a terrific job and there isn't anything I would change about the character. He's in a place similar to where the encyclopedists were at the end of season one. They dedicated their lives to something only to find out that it wasn't what they thought it was. Polly's claim to fame is that he met the actual prophet. He was there when Harry Seldon came out. But now he spent his entire life misleading people in an ends justifies the means scenario. I'm curious to see where he fits into things now that Warden Font has been incinerated. And I hope we see more of him. The idea of Gale seeing Salvor's death should be interesting for how things develop between them and their whole story. Gale and Harry represent the mathematical kind of straightforward rational thinking, while Salvor seems more intuitive. You would expect that they will react to this news that she has an expiration date in different ways, but then also, if they believe Gale has precognitive abilities, what do they do with that? And on top of that, you've got the mule who fears the second foundation, which means they must develop one of those at some point. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how they react to knowing some of these things are inevitable ahead of time and how that influences their decisions. One thing I didn't mention in the recap was Salvor's trip outside to manually fix one of the stabilizers. This does underline some ideas about the character. She's resourceful and willing to put herself in danger when necessary. And she can read the room and start yelling at Harry to get the ship running when that's necessary. Otherwise, he might have been there all day going in circles with Gale. Even though that's all true, these are the kinds of scenes that I could take or leave. Which is just a matter of taste, but I often don't dwell on them whenever I'm thinking about the big story. This is still very impressive. I mean, this looks like I'm watching someone on a planet that's covered with water in the middle of a crazy storm fighting the elements so that they don't get crushed by this giant wave. I can't imagine that's easy to make, and it also looks like it would probably be a lot of fun. And the CG shot of the sky after they clear the clouds looks great, so credit where credit's due. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, I look forward to every time Sarath opens her mouth. There's that awkward moment at dinner when even Rue is like she's going to talk her way out of a marriage, and no matter how that turns out, I'm not tired of her taking every chance to land jabs at the dynasty. And I'm not discounting how much Lee Pace's reactions add to that. Because, as usual, he's doing a terrific job of acting like he isn't annoyed while having enough of that there to show how he really feels. Dawn also gets some added layers because it seems like he's attracted to Sarath too. Or maybe he's the only one who's into her because you can't really tell what day. This would present some possibilities because Don is losing his chance to rule, so it wouldn't be a big surprise if Sarath tried to use them to work against each other. Demerzel didn't feature as heavily as in the last episode, but pretty much everything she does, everything she did here seems important in one way or another. I'm not sure why she was lingering behind looking at the mural, but I am sure that we were supposed to notice it. There were a couple of moments where it seemed like Sarath might be thinking of focusing some of her pokes in that direction, and I was just thinking how bad of an idea that would likely turn out to be. Also, when she brought her up in the clone room, it answered a question I've had for a while. What did the citizens think about Demerzel, who's there, she's in public, she's around for their whole lives, and she never ages? I guess the most popular theory turns out to be that she's a clone too. As far as books to show stuff goes, without giving away any future spoilers, I do think this episode showed promise in that area. Possibly the most promise it's shown thus far. The religious angle with the underlying economic control of the outer reach is an important step in developing the first foundation. These are things that psychohistory could predict. Getting to the reason why the second foundation is crucial and how that's supposed to function is something I've been hoping to see. Bel Rios, Hober Mallow, and the Mule are all great characters. 
At the same time, there are some things here that might make a book reader like myself wonder. Introducing the mule here in this way is a choice. Having the vault which means the version of Harry's consciousness that resides there, knowing the name Hober Mallow, and then displaying that after incinerating the warden is all a little bit surprising. But I try not to have knee-jerk reactions to this stuff because I think Salvor's season one arc reveals some things about how the writers think. There they played with the idea that individuals aren't important in relation to psychohistory. They took that idea and they said, so why don't we have a character that thinks that they're special, that everyone around them thinks they're special, only for that not to be the case? Which is not a bad idea necessarily. It plays with something that we're familiar with if we've read the story. But in this case, its effectiveness is compromised somewhat because on some level, Gale and Salvor are special because of their abilities. So I'm not sure if the point they were trying to make landed. I guess time will tell on that. But the point I'm making here is that I think they're trying to put their own spin on things and they might be able to surprise us when we see how some of those choices play out. I'd be happy to be surprised, and I think that is a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.